give life. You are love. You bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. Great are you, Lord, and it's your Pray together and then let's jump in to God's word this morning. Jesus, we love you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity 
just to serve and love our community. Thank you for my church family that's watching and listening this morning. God, I don't know what's going on in everybody's lives, but God, I acknowledge that you do. You love them. You have compassion. And God, you're aware of every situation and every circumstance. Father, I also thank you for your word. God, I thank you that it is alive, that it is powerful. And Father, as we start this new series today, God, I pray in Jesus' name you would speak to our hearts. Father, I pray that you would inspire us, you would encourage us, you would challenge us, Father, to be everything you've called and created us to be. Jesus, we love you. In Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen. We're going to begin a new series this morning on leadership called Change Your World. For the next five weeks, we're going to be talking about how you can be the leader that God has called and created you to be. Uh, you see, a lot of times we say that leaders are born and not made, but I don't believe that at all. I believe that leaders can be made. You can grow into the leader God wants you to be. For 20 years now, I've been blessed with the opportunity to speak and to train leaders in the United States and all over the world. And regardless of culture or industry, I found that people are desperately looking for leaders to follow. I've seen many people paralyzed from becoming leaders themselves because of self-doubt or failure or insecurities. Frankly, I've also seen people captivated at the prospect of life-giving leadership. See, leadership is one of the key essentials in helping us become everything God wants us to become. The Bible puts it this way in Proverbs eleven fourteen: Without wise leadership, a nation falls. There is safety in having many advisors. This is true across the spectrum of our lives. Without wise leadership, churches are in trouble. Without wise leadership, families are in trouble. Without wise leadership, businesses are in trouble. Communities are in trouble. And even nations are in trouble. John Maxwell writes it this way. He says that everything rises and falls on leadership. Unfortunately, I think we can all agree there is a shortage of godly life-giving leaders in our world today. That's why this topic, that's why this series is so important. Because you, you can change your world. You may never have thought of yourself as a leader, but you are. Leadership is influence. And anytime you have influence on anybody, you are a leader. So the question is not whether or not you lead. The question is whether or not you're a godly leader, whether or not you're a life-giving leader. Every time you interact, you have influence. And the Bible says that if you are a believer, God expects you to lead others for good, to lead others in the godly way, to lead others in kingdom purpose. So today what I want us to do is I want us to start by laying a foundation for the next few weeks by looking at the greatest leader who has ever lived, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And let's answer the question, how can I lead like Jesus? If you're taking notes first, if I'm going to be a leader that leads like Jesus, I have to understand my identity. And you have to understand your identity. This is the foundation of leadership. It's self-awareness. You have to know who you are. You have to know your identity. You cannot try to be someone else. Leaders can't fall into the ebb and flow depending on popular opinion or culture. Leaders know their strengths and they know their weaknesses. And ultimately, leaders know their values. They know what they stand on. They know what they believe on. And leaders know who they are. You see, Jesus, he had no doubt in his identity. And in the scriptures, Jesus tells us who he is. He says, I am the light of the world. I am the son of God. I am the way, the truth, the life. I am the bread of life. Jesus gives us 18 I am statements in the gospels. And in John 8, Jesus also says, I testify on my own behalf. Now, Jason, what does that mean? Jesus is saying, I don't depend on other people's opinions of me to know who I am. 
I know who I am. I know who God has created me to be. Jesus said, I know my story and I'm the one who tells it. He knew his identity. The problem is if you don't know who you are, you can fall into some common traps. If you don't know who you are, you can be easily manipulated by others. You've heard me say before, God has a plan and purpose for your life, but so does everybody else. The enemy wants to derail that purpose. Other people in your life, maybe they see the influence that they have and they want to manipulate that. They want to jump on board with that and use it for their own ideas and their own purposes. If you don't know who you are, you can be easily manipulated. If you don't know who you are, you'll be a hypocrite. You will live a lie. And if you don't know who you are, you can be overwhelmed by stress. Trying to be something that you're not is extremely stressful. That's why we have to know who we are. And here's the beautiful thing, friends. God tells us who we are. We don't have to look to the world. We don't have to look to social media. We don't have to look to our jobs. We can look in God's Word, the Bible, and we can see who God says that we are. And maybe if you don't hear anything else that I say today, maybe if you'll just grab a hold of this and understand who God says you are. He says, I am alive with Christ. I am free from the law of sin and death. I am far from oppression. I will not live in fear, Isaiah 54 says. I am born of God and the evil one does not touch me. I am holy and without blame before Him in love. I have the mind of Christ, Philippians says. I have the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. The Spirit of God who is greater than the enemy in the world lives in me, 1 John 4 says. I have received abundant grace and the gift of righteousness and reign in life through Jesus Christ, Paul wrote in Romans. I have received the power of the Holy Spirit. He can do miraculous things through me. I have authority and power over the enemy of this world, Mark says and Luke says. I am renewed in the knowledge of God and no longer want to live in my own ways or nature before I accepted Christ. I am merciful. I do not judge others. I forgive quickly. As I do this by God's grace, He blesses my life. God supplies all my needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I can do whatever I need to do in life through Christ Jesus who gives me strength. I'm born again, spiritually transformed, renewed, and set apart for God's purpose. First Peter says, I'm God's workmanship created in Christ to do good works that He has prepared for me to do. I am an ambassador for Christ. I'm a part of a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a purchased people. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. I belong to Him. I'm not ruled by fear because the Holy Spirit lives in me and gives me His power and love and self-control. Christ lives in me and I live by faith in Him. And His love for me, I don't know about you, but there was a season of my life where I didn't know my identity or I really placed my identity in the things of the world. I was so concerned about my career, climbing the corporate ladder, having people look at me. Really, I was addicted to achievement in a season in my life. And I'll never forget going on a mission trip to Nicaragua, getting away from the world, getting away from distractions, and just getting to focus on loving people and doing what God had told me to do. And I'll never forget, it was during that time those moments with Him were so rich and so intimate. And God reminded me that I was not defined by my career. I was not defined by my achievements. I was defined by my obedience to Him. And nothing's been the same since. Because I focused my life on serving Jesus, on listening to Him. God, what would you have me to do? And understanding that I'm defined by His love. What Jesus did on the cross for me, that defines me. And nothing else. Second, if you're taking notes, if you're going to lead like Jesus, you've got to discover your purpose. If I'm going to lead like Jesus, I have to know what I am meant to accomplish. I must clarify 
what God has called me to do in this life. This is so important, friends. Because the direction of your life is really your choice. You can listen to God or you cannot listen to God. And He gives you the free will to choose. And if you don't like the direction that your life is headed right now, you can listen to God and you can change it. Leaders don't only know who they are, but they know where they're headed. They know what God has called them to do. And when you clarify that goal, when you clarify that purpose, then you are set free from the tyranny of the urgent. You know as well as I do what's urgent and what's important are two different things. And a lot of things that are urgent won't even matter in a week from now. But what's important is going to matter forever and ever. See, you have to know the direction that you're going. You have to know the purpose for your life. But not only for your life. There can be a purpose for your marriage. A vision for your marriage. A, a vision for your parenting. A vision for your career. A vision for your friendships. This is what I know. The Bible is clear. Without vision, the people perish. Without vision, your marriage perishes. Without vision, your parenting relationship, they perish. And the problem is, is that most of our lives, there's either no vision or there's die vision. And that's not a good place to be. I know in my life, Jessica and I, we have a vision. For what we want our marriage to be like, we have a vision. For that day that our kids walk across the stage and graduate high school and they decide to move out. and We know what we want them to look like. We know what we believe God has called us to invest in their lives. So we're intentional. And we need to be intentional about our every day. God has a purpose for you. Jesus knew exactly what He was called to do. He knew exactly what He was called to accomplish. He was a straightforward leader. And He established clear-cut goals. Again, these are Jesus' own words in John 8, 14. I know where I came from, and I know where I am going, Jesus said. Unfortunately, our culture glorifies busyness. While God is looking for productivity, Productivity comes from accomplishing your purpose. And Jesus had a clear purpose. He knew who He was. He knew what He was trying to do. He was a purpose-driven leader. And Luke 4 says this, Luke 4, 43, But Jesus replied, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too, because that is why I was sent. Jesus knew that He was here to preach the Gospel. The good news of the Kingdom. And that's what He dedicated His life to doing. Do you know what the first recorded words of Jesus were in the Bible? He was 12 years old. He was a preteen. He wasn't even a teenager yet. And He said, I must be about my Father's business. His first public statement. I must be about my Father's business. Even then, even as a preteen, he already knew what he was going to accomplish with his life. And, and then the bookmark, the book into that, when he was on the cross, and his last words, it is finished. He had accomplished what God had called him and created him and sent him to do. You've got to know your purpose. Next, you've got to know your motivation. If you're going to lead like Jesus, you've got to know your motivation. This is all about knowing who you are trying to please. Listen, if you're a leader, you know you're not going to keep everybody happy. Just at the time you get this group happy, then that group's going to be upset. And then when you get that group happy, this group's going to be ticked off at you. And then when you get this group happy and excited, then the other group is going to be upset. You can't please everyone. Even God doesn't please everybody. And Jesus experienced this. There were people that didn't like Jesus. He was perfect, and they didn't care for Him. And in John 5.30, Jesus says, I only try to please the One who sent me. 
Jesus had a singular priority. He wanted to please God. And I'm going to tell you, if you lead, you're going to have people, they're going to heap praises on you, and you're going to have people, then they're going to heap criticism on you. And what I have found as a leader is you've got to be careful listening to the praise, and you've got to be careful listening to the critics. You've got to listen to God. You've got to know what He wants. Your motivation, it can't be fame. It can't be fortune. It can't be the spotlight. It's got to be Jesus. That has to be your motivation. Next, if you're a leader, you need to value your team. Value your team because leadership is never by itself. You can't be a leader if no one is following you. Leadership is always in the context of a team, a community, a small group. Maybe it's your work team. Maybe it's a ministry at church. Maybe it's your family. But to be a leader, you've got to build a good team. All great leaders are great team builders. Think about this. Jesus, God in the flesh, could have done all of His ministry by Himself. But He didn't. He chose not to. He enlisted a team. He surrounded Himself with people that He invested in, people that He did life with, people that He empowered. Mark 3.14 says, He appointed twelve, designating them apostles, that they might be with Him and He might send them out to preach. You've got to value your team. You've got to show people that you love them, that you care about them, that you're concerned about them, that you don't just value them because of what they're doing, but you value them because of who they are. Now think about this church. This church has never been about one person. It's been about Jesus and about the people that Jesus has brought to accomplish the vision and the mission. For almost nine years now, we've got to do this together. We've gotten to serve together, to love together, to grieve and mourn together. And the greatest privilege of my life has been getting to serve with you and accomplish this vision Jesus has given us with you. We value other people here. We value the team. We value the family. And I would encourage you, whether it's at work, if you're a leader at work, value your team. Don't just see your employees as a means to an end, but actually get to know them personally. Invest in them. Show them respect. Give them encouragement. And maybe it's your family. There is no one more important that you need to lead than your family. And so spending time investing in your spouse, investing in your children, showing them love, giving them attention, listening to what they have to say. Value the team God has given you. And lastly, Friends, you've got to focus on the kingdom. If you're going to lead like Jesus did, you've got to make the decision to focus on what is important because life is filled with distractions. Has anybody else noticed that? Life is filled with distractions. And right now, you can get on social media and you can get riled up about things that aren't even important and that don't even matter in the grand scheme of things. Remember, Our life, let's face it, our life is like a a blot. It is like a blip in the grand scheme of eternity. And again, Jesus was our model for living a focused life. Luke 9.51, one of my favorite statements in the Bible. As the time drew near for Jesus' return to heaven, He moved steadily onward towards Jerusalem with an iron will. Remember, Jesus was heading towards Jerusalem to die on the cross for us, to be resurrected. And He did it with an iron will. He was persistent. He was determined. He was focused. There was nothing that was going to stop Him from getting to the cross. Friends, you have incredible spiritual potential. Whether you see it or not in your life, up to this point, you have incredible spiritual potential. But that spiritual potential is not going to be realized in any of our lives 
until we break through the barrier of deciding what is really important in this life. And we've got to focus on the right thing. We've got to focus on the Jesus thing. We've got to focus on the kingdom. That is what is truly important. If you're going to lead like Jesus, you've got to know Jesus in a personal way. Friends, God loves you more than you could ever imagine. He loves you so much that even though our relationship with God was broken because of sin, even though we were separated from God, even though the Bible says we were enemies of God because of our sin, God loved you so much. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life, to die on a cross for our sins, to spill his blood so that you and I could be forgiven and set free. And Jesus didn't stay dead. He died on that cross. They placed his body in a borrowed tomb. And three days later, he was resurrected. He came back to life again. He was raised from the dead to prove to everyone that he really was the son of God in the flesh. The one with the power, the authority, the propensity to forgive our sin. And the Bible is clear. If you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord. And if you'll believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You'll be rescued. You won't have to spend an eternity in hell when you die. You'll get to spend an eternity with God in His presence. And right now, while you're on this earth, you'll get to live with the Spirit of God residing in you, leading you and guiding you each and every day. You will never be alone again. You will be forgiven. You'll be clean. You'll have a brand new life. But friends, it's a decision that only you can make. A pastor can't make it for you. A priest can't make it for you. Your parents can't make it for you. And right now, I want to give you that decision to place your faith in Jesus Christ. Just whatever you're doing, right where you're at, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. If that's you, God, I've been going my own direction with my life. I've been doing my own thing. God, and in fact, I've been trying to be you. But today I realize I'm a sinner separated from you, God. And I need a Savior. And I believe that Savior is your Son, Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus died on a cross. I believe that God raised Him from the dead. And I believe He is still alive calling me to Himself right now. God, would you forgive me? Would you change me? Would you make me brand new today? Jesus, you are my Lord and I love you. And Jesus, I want to follow you for the rest of my life. And Jesus, it's in your name I pray. Amen. If that was you, if you prayed that prayer, congratulations. It's the greatest decision that you can make with your life. And the Bible says that all of heaven is celebrating you right now. And we celebrate along with heaven. But I want to ask you, please do not change the channel. Do not turn this video off without letting us know the decision that you made. I want to reach out. I, I want to pray for you by name. I want to send you resources to help you grow. Be everything God has called and created you to be. You can go on our website right now. Click the I'm new tab. Fill out a digital connect card. Give us a name, an email address, a phone number. Just some way to reach out. And I cannot wait to celebrate you by name. To pray for you by name. And thank Jesus for all he has done in your life. I love you. Our church family loves you. If you need anything at all. If you have prayer requests, if you have needs, don't hesitate to reach out. We want to be your family. And if you're watching and you're not local to our local church and you'd say, Jason, I need help finding a life-giving church in my community, just reach out and let us know. We would love to help you find a life-giving local church where you can grow and be a part of community. Let me pray for you. I love you. I hope you have an incredible week. Now go and be the church. Jesus, we love you so much. Thank you for my church family that's watching on TV and watching online. God, I pray that right now, wherever they're watching from, whether it's a home or a hospital bed, whether it's at work, whether it's on travel, God, I pray that they would experience your power and presence in this moment. That the Holy Spirit would be so real as he ministers to them right now. God, I don't know what's going on in everybody's life, but I know that you do. And Jesus, I ask you, would you meet people where they're at? Would you provide joy? Would you provide peace, provision, healing? 
God, would you show yourself strong in their lives today? Jesus, we love you. In Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Oh,